Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. My name is Nolan. This is SAC Interactive. I run this monthly tech meetup here in Zoom. Uh, it is always free. It is always the third Wednesday of the month at 6.30 p.m. California time. Uh, it's co-run by Rob and Bill, who are not here. They both teach night classes sometimes, so they help with behind the scenes things. And I'm the one running the meetings here in person. Uh, we're always looking for speakers to um, speak of the group. And we're always looking for topic ideas. If you have a suggestion on something you'd like to hear somebody present on, even if it's not you yourself doing the talking. Uh, the topics we cover here are anything related to web and mobile development. It does not have to be beginner, intermediate, or advanced. Anything in that spectrum is valid. Um, well, we've done talks on how to build iPhone video games, how to write Minecraft plugins, new JavaScript frameworks that have come out, old JavaScript frameworks that have been out, database techniques, Amazon Web Service stuff, you name it, if it's related to web and mobile development, it's a topic that we would love to cover here in SAC Interactive. Uh, if you are not already on our mailing list and would like to be so, please shoot me a DM with your email address and I'll add you to the list. I promise we don't spam anybody. We just send messages about what meetings are coming up and that sort of thing. Uh, and with that, tonight we have one of the, our always favorite uh, speakers, Corbin. And yeah. Corbin, being the Corbin that he is, wrote a React form library from scratch because he never sleeps. And uh, I was going to tell you about how that went. Uh, Corbin, do you need anything before we get going? No, no good? not really. All right. Uh, the floor is yours. Take it away, my friend. Awesome. Uh, so uh, first things first, uh, just so I'm knowing like what to cover and what not to cover. Has anyone here not used React by chance? If you haven't, that's okay. But like general... General vibe check. Like, is anyone unfamiliar with React? Pretty unfamiliar. Pretty unfamiliar. Yeah. Uh, have you used any other like Angular or Vue? Yeah, a little bit. Not much. Okay. okay. Cool. Well, then I will try to use that as a frame of reference. So if there, but uh, this is you know like if there's at any point you you see something and you're like, whoa, what is that? Feel free to stop me. I will answer the question and then uh, we can uh, address it right then and there. So. Yeah. All right. So uh, I'm Mike Corbin, uh, and I wrote a new React form library um, called Houseform. And why is kind of a story. So we're going to give that story. And then I'm going to show you what the alternatives were and why we didn't go with those alternatives and what Houseform, like what merits does it stand on on its own. So. First of all, who am I? My name is Corbin Crutchley. I don't know why there's a picture there. You already know what I look like because I'm right here. But I'm the author of Houseform. Um, I'm a principal front-end engineer at a pretty small company. Um, I lead a front-end team of two devs plus myself on the front-end. We have one more dev on the team since I wrote this slide. Um, and we are in charge of over 14 applications. That is 14 distinct APKs, websites, whatever you want to call it. And it's in one code base, one monorepo, one Git repository. Um, and it's entirely powered by React and React Native. And the only way that we are able to make that many applications with such a small team is just by crazy amounts of code sharing, right? If something runs on the web, it better run on mobile. If it runs on mobile, it better run on the web. And if it doesn't, we replace it for something that does, even if it's homegrown. Something worth noting is that some of these applications are very form heavy, right? So um, first, uh, we're going to talk about what's in a form, like what makes up a form, what, what is the complexity. Then we're going to talk about how to build forms. There's actually an Angular slide in here. So hopefully that's helpful, Angus. Um, then we're going to talk about how to build a form with React without a library. And then we're going to talk about the most popular uh, alternative called Formic. Um, what's wrong with it? We're going to then look at some alternatives, and then we're going to look at house form finally and how it differs. So if you know some of those icons or logos off to the side, you might have a hint about like where the direction of this is going. If not, that's okay. We'll get there. So within a form, uh, this isn't like a super example web or application um, that you can see off to the side. Not quite what our apps look like, but good enough for visual purposes. Um, it displays a few key components of a field, uh, form, sorry. We have field validation, right? So we need to validate that this email address here is in fact an email address. Um, we may wanna validate these on different types of methods, 
right? So like uh, if you have a form and you click on a field and then you click away from the field, that's called a blur. And you may want to validate your error messages on that stage. You may want to validate your error message on changing a value. Um, or maybe like when you submit the form, you want to check to make sure this email address isn't already in your database. So that right there is three different types of validation. And that's just the the a super simple demo right here, right? Um, on top of that, you might have different input types. You might have like number inputs, you might have radio checkboxes, you might have actual checkboxes. Um, so even though forms seem really simple, they can quickly grow in complexity. One of our applications has like 30 fields in one form, um, and they can quickly become a bit challenging to manage, right? Um, in Angular, you have some built-in functionality. You have like form groups and form control, right? So here... Um, we can see that in the class app, we're defining a form, which is made up of a form group with one form control. We have validators that say this field is required and it's a minimum length of four. So you have to have a name with four characters. And then we can say something like input of type text. Uh, and if there are any errors on this input, go ahead and display them. Otherwise, submit and show the value. Right. So here there's a few things worth noting. One, this is form based validation. Right. Yes, we have validators on each field, but they are defined in the greater context of a form. Right. Two, this is template controlled. So you'll notice that like our template is defining what part of the UI maps to which part of the logic in the form. Um, and then, of course, there's metadata about the field. Has the field been touched? Has the user like tapped on the input and tapped away? Um, is it dirty, as in has the user typed anything into this field? Um, and finally, is it valid or invalid, right? So these are all important things to keep in mind. So this is pretty small, right? This is like, what, 40 lines of code? And we could easily expand this uh, with more fields pretty trivially. This is one of the benefits of Angular is that you kind of have stuff built right in. You don't have to bike shed. You don't have to question how you're doing forms. It's built right in the framework, right? React, on the other hand, doesn't really have a story for forms. So here's what an example of a homegrown React form might look like, right, without a library. So here we have a state of form, which has an initial value of a field, and that field has some metadata, right? We then have some validation rules, which are like functions that we want to run over the name field, right? So required must be at least four characters. And then we have this use form hook. Again, not a library. This is a custom hook that I'll show you the code of in a second. And then here, what we do is we check to see if the field has changed, check to see that the field is blurred, and then bind the value to the set state, right? So this is already a little bit longer, and then you realize that I'm abstracting a bunch of the code and that this code uses a bunch of like really slow, gross ways of storing data, which isn't very optimized. Like this is slow. This code is just slow, but it's the closest to like Angular that I can reasonably think of, right? So this is kind of hard to reuse already, right? It doesn't abstract away like the state. Like every time you add a new field, you have to add three subfields, which is kind of annoying, right? Um, you have to make sure that validation rules is at least an empty array, and then you have to manage errors, and it's just a lot, right? Now, granted, there are other ways to build this, but this is a pretty straightforward example without too many bells and whistles that functions, right? So what could we do better, right? Um, the answer from uh, Jared Palmer, who is now leading Vercel, um, well, leading uh, developer tooling at Vercel uh, was Formic. So here we have a uh, schema, which is defined by a library called YEP. And YEP has built-in validators. It has minimum lengths, uh, uh, required fields, email validation, phone number validation. It has all kinds of built-in validation logic. And here we can see that that's it. This is the entire boilerplate, right? Like as opposed to like, bah, all this stuff. It's just literally, what's your schema? And then assign it an initial value. That's it, right? 
Um, so one of the advantages of Formic is that you can use it as a headless mode, which means that it doesn't display any UI by default. Um, this demo that I'm showing right here is not a headless version of Formic. Um, you can tell because there's no like child, like there's a child function past a Formic, right? Which is like a function that you pass in that Formic then runs under the hood. Um, but the problem is that like field isn't headless right now. So we'd have to change the API, which is a bit of a headache and like, uh, you know, but the reason why headlessness is important is because it means that you can run your logic completely, uh, divorced from your UI layer. So you can use React Native for mobile, or you can re use React for web, uh, and you can kind of intermix and mingle between them. And the, the form library shouldn't care about what you, UI you're using. Um, alternative, if you're, alternatively, if you're using a UI library, um, like maybe Material UI, you can just drop it in without having to do all sorts of jumping through hoops. So headless is really good and really, really, really important for our business needs because we use React Native and React. So we need to be able to switch out that UI layer pretty constantly. So we liked Formic, but we couldn't use it. Um, why? Well, when we were doing research on Formic as part of an early spike, we noticed some things. We noticed that there's a lot of unresolved issues, a lot of open pull requests, and that the releases haven't been updated in a little bit, not too long ago, but a little bit, with no kind of word and mention of what's going on under the hood. And as we dug deeper, these are all real GitHub issues, we kind of noticed that there's not really any maintenance of it anymore. Jared appears to have gone and done brighter and bigger things, um, which to be clear is very good. Um, like, like, you know, it's important that, that he's able to, to spend time where he's, uh, sees fit. Um, and on top of that, no one's really paying for Formic. So like, it's not his duty. Um, but we wanted to see if there was a community fork. The closest appeared to be John Rom, who made huge changes towards a potential version three, um, made a lot of commits, good progress, looks like awesome changes. But this is where the shoe drops. He's not a maintainer of Formic, and he does not get to decide if his changes to Formic were up to him. And it appears that he's abandoned his work on version three. So, so much for uh, Community Fork. So um, once again, though, John Rom and Jared Palmer don't owe us anything. Their work has been awesome and influential but this is a concern for our business, right? We want to use software that we know is going to be maintained, software that we can understand the internals of. And after di diving into Formix source code, um, we we were worried about being to being able to maintain it. So um, there was a question: Why is Formix not updated for a long time? Um, is there an issue? It's not clear. Um, Jared Palmer stayed fairly quiet on the issue. Um, it, I honestly would just chalk it up to he's busy. You know, um, Formic is a massive project with a, a lot of moving parts and a fairly complicated code base. Pretty standard for most open source libraries. Um, but like I said, Jared Palmer is doing really, really big things. He started Turbo Repo. Um, he's joined Vercel. Um, so I just think it's a matter of, you know, um, cost benefit analysis. If he's not using it today and he thinks there are better solutions out there, which maybe he does, maybe he doesn't, he hasn't communicated um, then why would he continue working on it when it's a big time effort, you know? So what were the alternatives? If not Formic, then what? Um, you know, there's a lot of different options out there. One of which being React Final Form, little logo in the corner there. I don't know if you'd seen Formic's logo. It's a nice little like weird little brick wall thing. It's pretty cool. React Final Form is their little final flag. That's neat. Um, and it looks really good at a first glance. Um, you have a form which has an on submit function, right? Um, you have a render function, so it's headless, um, as far as I can tell. Um, you can then have your validation logic in line within your field, which I really like um, because we'll come back to why I like this a lot more. But the gist of it is that like, if we go look at the formic example, your UI validation logic lives up here, but then your UI itself lives down here, 
right? So, you, so like this isn't necessarily a problem on a code base this small, but as your forms start to grow and grow and grow, we want to be able to consolidate where the UI lives and where the validation logic lives. We want them to kind of live in harmony so that we don't have to go editing three or four parts of the code to see what's needing to be changed, right? And that's something that React Final Form seems to have done, um, which we like a lot. So validation right in line with the UI, um, but we ran into our good old friend maintenance issues. There's only been 15 commits since 2021, um, and it, it's just seen a similar level of support from the community as Formic. So that's not really a choice for us either. Um, it's also unclear whether it supports React Native well or not. Um, it seems like it should be able to because it is headless um, using some APIs, but then people were reporting that it like would throw an error abruptly and that you couldn't use it with React Native. So it's I didn't spend too much time diving into it because of the maintenance issues. So the other option is something, a library called React Hook Form, right? So this is a version for the web. It's super well-maintained. Like literally every day I go check on it, it's got a new commit, a new pull request merged a new something. It's really impressive how well maintained it is. Um, instead of being based on components, it's based on hooks. Um, oh, also, I apologize. I missed a question. Can anybody update Formic other than its creator? Yes. Yes, they can. And that's kind of what I was talking about with John Rom, right? Is that they are not the original creator of Formic. Um, and we could theoretically fork it, but I'll get to why we didn't do that later. So like theoretically, we could pick up the work from John Rom and like make Formic like new and maintained and shiny and fixed, basically. Um, so back to React hook form. Uh, here we're defining a form. We have a uh, register and handle submit. And it's as simple as registering an input by saying register the name of the field and then pass validation items into it, right? Pretty neat, pretty neat. Um, we like that it's field-based validation um, with a little asterisk there that we'll get to in a second. Um, it uses hooks to define forms, which you know we're kind of neutral on. Um, but the one thing we didn't like is that it's uncontrolled by default. So if you're familiar with React, like there's this way that you can bind a value to a field. And then when you go and update that value, it'll re-render the field and it'll have the new value bound to it. Well, instead, the way that this works is it just lets you store the value in the DOM. And then it syncs the value from the DOM to React, but never syncs it back from Re React to the DOM. This works fine, except for the fact that now when you remove the DOM, like in React Native, it doesn't work. Like this doesn't work with React Native, this API. So in order to get React hook form working with React Native, we have to use a totally different API called Controller. Controller is similarly headless. Um, so we have a render function that just has a checkbox. And then, you know, we we pass in whatever UI we want to render here. We can have rules associated with it. Um, but it's a little bit more complicated, right? Um, and on top of that, if you want to use something like Yep or Zod, um, because this is where the asterisk for the field-based validation comes into play, you can't use your own functions with this rules object. You have to use a predefined list of like three or four different validations, which is kind of a massive headache because we have much more uh, strenuous validation requirements than just what is built in, right? So if we wanna go outside of those bounds, we have to use form-based validation using a schema, um, again, either using a library called yep or a different library called Zod. And then like, we register it, and then we have uh, the resolver set. Like, it's it's just not quite as nice. This seems like Formic, but with multiple different APIs, and it's just kind of a mess. Um, so here's the problems with Formic, right? First one is maintenance. It's a non-starter. Um, but then the second one and the third one is we have many APIs to do the same thing in Formic. Like this is three different ways to do the same things and they all have their pros and cons. There's actually a fourth way, but I'm not going to get into that because that's a bit of an advanced topic. Um, so that's four ways to do one field. And it's just a lot, you know, 
it's a lot to keep in mind. It's a lot of cost benefit analysis to do every time you're making a form. Um, and it's just not, not what we wanted. Um, and then on top of that, we wanted field based validation. We think that the, the UI and the, the render logic should live in the same place, right? So even if Formic was perfect and it was well-maintained, we would still have some frustrations around the API and its usage, right? Meanwhile, React Final Form has maintenance issues, unknown React Native support, um, and no built-in ability to use Yep and Zod, which save a lot of development time because Yep and Zod, you can rewrite your own functions to treat like validation the same way you would want, like email validators, uh, text validators, whatnot. But having them pre-built for you is pretty convenient, pretty convenient. We wanted to see some Yep and Zod support. So, you know, the first one non-starter, the second one is a big question mark that we might be able to fix. And then the third one is just like, ah, oh, that, that kind of stinks, you know? And then finally, React Hook Form, which has many APIs to do the same thing, has very limited field-based support. Um, and overall, we didn't like that it was uncontrolled. The React core team officially has said that they recommend controlled components. Um, and React Hook Form seems like it has more headaches than it's worth. Speaking with a lot of other engineers who have used React Hook Form, um, they've expressed that like the uncontrolled nature of how it's built leads to a lot of like roundabout programming like behavior to try to offset weird bugs and behaviors that'll show up kind of abruptly when using it. So we wanted to look at these things, right? We wanted it to be well-maintained. So we had to fork either, if we wanted to go with something controlled, which we were pretty sure we wanted. Uh, and if we wanted something field-based, we were either going to have to fork React Final Form or Formic and both of them have pretty complicated code bases. Neither one of them has an API we really wanted. So I thought, can we do better? You know, like, can we do better? And how long will it take for us to do something that we like? So I built Houseform. Um, it took me about a week to do a proof of concept. It took me two weeks to get like a version one up and running. And then it took me a, a maybe another week to do a documentation website, which we'll take a look at in a second. So we had like a fully functioning with documentation, with tests, with benchmarks, version one of the library within a month. Um, I felt much more comfortable with the code base than I did uh, alternatives, partially because I wrote it from scratch. You know, like I, I, I no one can get better in my brain than my brain, right? <laughs> you know, so there's a bit of training benefit there for the company. Um, but here's the cool parts about it. One, there's one API to do everything. There's no multiple different ways of doing things. It's one API. That API is fully headless. It's controlled. It's per field validation. It also has the ability to do different types of validation. So for example, you can see this on change validate. You can change that for an on blur validate or an on submit validate. And you can customize which style validation you want for each field, which is something the others do not have whatsoever. Um, and it has Zod support built right in. So instead of yep, we just say on change validate, we expect this to be a string and have it be an email, right? So like I was saying earlier, we have four different validation strategies, which is like on change, on submit. Um, and on top of supporting Zod, we also support asynchronous functions, which allow you to resolve a value or reject it with an error message. And you can sit there and mix and match and have on submit for one and on change for another and on validate for another and kind of play with it and tweak it to your heart's content. So with that said, let's go build a form with house form. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to our homepage, um, which has dark mode. Ooh, I don't know why I felt like that was the first thing I wanted to point out, but you know, it's cool. Um, we have uh, a YouTube, I was so surprised by this. We, uh, uh, James Perkins is like a, a mutual mind who just dropped a YouTube video like the first month this library came out about how to use Houseform. Like it's it's super well produced, it's it's awesome. I love that, that he did that. Um, but if we go down to the bottom, we can edit this example. And we can say something like, 
Let's do this. What's an example of a form someone would want to build potentially? Feel free to unmute for a second and like just shout out an example of a form. Could be a medical form of some kind, could be a, a, any examples. New customer sign up. Customer sign up. All right, cool. So customer sign up starts with form, right? We might have an on submit function, which we'll come back to. And the way that you would define a form is that we have an arrow function, right? Uh, which, sorry, there we go. Okay. So we start with an arrow function that defines our UI. So if I put a paragraph tag in here and I say test, it'll render test, right? The form is just meant there to, to create state and manage the controls, right? So then inside of here, we might have like a div, and inside of that div, we might have a field. A field needs a name. So let's say username. And similarly, this will have a, a function, child function. And we can say input. Now, each of these functions is past specific properties from house form. So here we might say set value and value. Right? So we can say value is type of value and on change will trigger set value e dot target dot value. Uh, here we go. Right. We're going to say this field is in fact a string. So that's TypeScript support built right in. Um, and we can add a label to this. So we can say username. Right. But, uh, and let's say it's a good, I don't think username needs a, a restriction, right? Like maybe we could say like minimum here, let's say on change validate is Z dot string dot min one must be at least one character long. And now we can see that if I type something, and then get rid of everything. Oh, I'm sorry. We now need to display the errors because the errors are being stored internally, but we're not showing the errors to the user, right? So let's say errors. Wow. Error. Okay, so now I can say that must be at least one character long, right? But this is kind of annoying, right? Like, let's say that we have a, a button that submits or sign up, right? Um, but we only want to show this error message once the user has already submitted the form, right? So let's go in here. We can change this to an actual HTML form. E dot prevent default to prevent the HTML form from re-rendering. We can say, I forget exactly how to do this. So I'm going to go look at my docs for a second. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Okay. Yeah. So we can just say prevent default and submit. There we go. Okay. So now what I can say is on the form itself, has it submitted? So I can say is submitted and that, and now it won't show any error messages until I hit sign up. But now if I start changing it on typing, it'll automatically show the error when it's expected, right? So we have the ability to get metadata about the form. We can get metadata about the field, including is touched, is dirty, stuff like usual. Um, we can say, like, let's create a field that's of type string and call it password. 
on change validate. Uh, we'll come back to that in just a second. I'm going to copy and paste the previous field. Okay. So Zod is pretty widely used. Uh, and what we can do is we can say, does it have a symbol? Ba, 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 ba. Okay, so there is dot regex. Sweet. So let's do this. Let's say string dot regex should support um, any character. What is a special character in regex? Uh, bah, 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 bah. I know there's a way to do it. Whatever. Sure. Good enough. And then, so that's our special character, right? We can then say dot regex needs to have uh, an uppercase letter. And then we can say lowercase letter. There we go. So now if I hit sign up, it'll yell at me unless if I have all of those things, right? So boom, we automatically have our, our password validation, right? And then we can even do a confirm password, right? So again, this is gonna be a string. We're gonna say name confirm password. We're going to do on change validate, which we will actually come back to. And then once again, I'm going to go hijack some of this. All right. So I mentioned earlier that we need to check uh, that that we want to check whether this confirmed password matches this password, right? And if they don't, it should say something down here, right? So what we can do is we can say value form, and we can say form dot get field value of password. So notice that we're just writing our own function here. Right. And we can say const pass field if pass field dot value equals value, then return promise dot resolve true, which means that there is no error. Otherwise, return promise dot reject passwords must match. So now if we do this. We can see that it's actually checking properly to make sure that the passwords match. Um, there is some wonkiness though, right? Like if I go add ASDF, ASDF up there, it doesn't rerun down here. So what we need to do is we need to go and say, listen to the password field. So anytime this runs validation, it also runs validation for the lower password as well. So we can do cross field reference validation. So we can validate one field based off the value of another pretty trivially with three lines of code, right? So that's it. That's our, that's our entire form. We now have the ability to make sure that the username has is input. We have password, right? And we can make sure that the special character exists and that it has an uppercase and once we submit, we can see that we get all the values from the field. And if there is one that isn't valid for some reason, we can't sign up. Unless if we say submit when invalid, 
equals true. I don't know if that's actually the name of the property, so I'm going to double check that. It's a good thing I wrote docs. It's called submit when invalid. So, oh, hey, cool. I got it right. So now we can still submit even if it is. Which version of type form is this? Ah, house form is too old. Sorry, this template is a bit older. So now I can run validation even if it uh, isn't correct. So, yeah. Uh, what else? Um, we have performance optimizations um, so that you can basically say something like, uh, this is a bit of an advanced topic, but the gist of it is that like, if you're not using any values outside the form, inside the form, you can tell React to never re-render the form unless if something inside the form has changed, which is a huge performance improvement when you're doing re-renders. Um, we have support for like number fields or uh, check boxes, or we have the ability to do nested fields. Um, so, you know, yeah, we have a lot of different functionality in here. Um, but at least for an initial demo, that's it. That is Houseform in a nutshell. Uh, so if you go to houseform.dev, um, if anyone is interested, go click this icon and start on GitHub. That would be, we surpassed 200. Holy cow. That's really cool. Uh, but yeah, that would mean a lot. So, yeah. 200 what? You clicked away from it pretty fast. Oh, sorry. GitHub stars. Ah, nice. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, anyways, any questions, any thoughts, any feedback, positive, negative, otherwise? Uh, this is sort of just big picture. Um, when you take on a project like this, you, you meet your immediate needs and you get to use it internally. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got to kind of uh, uh, create some tech debt going forward, I guess, where you're going to want to um, make updates. And, you know, if uh, what's the library uses, um, uh, if that changes, you know, do you have to do, you know, do an update? And, um, do you have a sense of how much uh, time that'll take you going forward? You know, it depends. Uh... I find that this problem exists in every form of engineering, whether it's library development or application development. And my answer tends to be that the more you front load at the start, the less likely you are to have to have maintain maintenance problems in the future. So what do I mean by that? This is the code base for house form. If I run yarn coverage, which is test coverage to make sure that I, my automated tests are hitting all the edge cases. It's not going to run the fastest because it's quite a few tests for very little code. Pretty good coverage, right? It's above 90s, above 99 for lines and statements. Um, some of this can be ignored, but really, you know, there's like, what, 10 lines of code that aren't tested? Um, on top of that, we also have benchmarks and we have a docs website that's built on a pretty stable foundation and we're not the fastest guns in town. Although I think our benchmarks are actually slightly off, um, due to reasons that are outside of our control that I'm waiting to hear back on from upstream. Um, but this benchmark alone has been hugely beneficial to see if we've introduced not a breaking change, but a performance problem in our code base, right? Um, I think you're right. There's always going to be some level of tech that, that we inherit, right? But the, the cost here was one, we take up Formic, we have a community fork, which are always kind of difficult to get off the ground. And we have an API that we're not super comfortable. We don't really like as much. And we have like, it's, it's kind of like a, a pro and con, right? We could have forked a, a, a much larger project or even used a, a React hook form, which didn't fit our needs as well. Um, or we could have, you know, we 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 went down the route that we did. Um, yes, Zod will change over time, but it's our only dependency and it's not even a real dependency. It's more of an optional peer dependency, which is getting into semantics a little bit. Um. So you could theoretically use house form without Zod if you wanted to. Like it, it wouldn't even be too difficult to do so. Um, you could even update house form to just 
make a a zod a quote unquote competitor to zod be a yeah a pluginable thing too so where house form doesn't even know that it's using zod to do that part of the validation it just knows it's using the thing that you configured to do validation and then swap zod out with whatever comes out next month right you know theoretically um, the other thing we we get to do is like let's uh let me drop into weasel really quick which is windows subset and don't worry, I'm not actually deleting anything permanently. Let's just say that we delete all of our tests. That's not the real number. Oh, I know why. Hang on. Here we go. It's only about 2,000 lines of code. No test. Actually, you know what? Hang on. That's a lie. There we go. It's only about a thousand lines of code for house forms source code. We have more, we have like three times as much code in tests and benchmarks, ignoring. Uh, I may have to drop in a bash for this um, word count cat star star dash star dot md word count dash words. We have 6,000 words. So we have more words than we do in our documentation, which is still working. Uh, uh, we're still developing it, right? So we're still improving the documentation. It's not done. There's more words in docs than there are tests, than there are benchmarks. And there's more code for benchmarks and tests than there is source lines of code. Um, you know, so overall, I'm not too anxious about house form. You know, like this compares to... Uh, let's go look at Formic really quick. I don't think I have Formic cloned. And again, this is not to say Formic is inherently a bad tool, right? Um, but it is more complex in its source code for better and for worse. Um, let's see here. Source, packages, SEC. Like... Okay, not that much more. I'm sure if we remove tests, let's let's see if we can do the same thing. Bash, remove that and that. Wait, where are their tests? Oh. Okay, yeah, so so double the source code. Is it that much worse? No, but look at that complexity. Like that's an automated complexity scale, but this kind of aligns with what I was seeing when I was looking at the source code. Like the complexity of house form is a hundred. Again, automated. So take these numbers with tiny grains of salt versus a complexity of the source code of almost 600, right? Like Formic has had more time to develop, but that also means it's had more time to grow in complexity. It also means that it's had more time um, to grow into a heavier uh, uh, a set uh, of package, right? So, like, you know, um, is it perfect? No, but I think that house form is going to be more maintainable for for us as a small shop than Formix would be. So, um, someone is asking, can house form be used, or can Formic be used in WordPress, and can house form be used in WordPress? Um, I so I believe. Nolan, correct me if I'm wrong, that WordPress primarily uses jQuery? Uh, it has been a while since I've looked under the hood at WordPress. I would have to check. Yeah. Truth Does be anybody told, else know the answer well. to that? Yeah. Um, But the answer is you could. You, I know people that deploy React frontends on WordPress CMSs. Um, it's not the most common use case, but you can. You mean, are you talking about like a headless CMS situation? Yeah, people use well, WordPress as a headless CMS of all things. Yeah, that you could do. Yeah, for sure. With house form or kind of whatever you want. Right. And one of the benefits um, of house form that, that I didn't talk about because it's a bit of a niche usage um, is that house form allows you to use native HTML forms which you are kind of challenging to do with Formic and especially with React Hook form. So what you can do is you can have a form that has no JavaScript enabled, but when JavaScript is enabled, it does client-side validation. 
So like you can do a, a post method or a, a like get method or, or a put method onto a form without JavaScript if it's disabled for whatever reason, but not show any error messages to the user and just send them back like a 404 status code, like back to a, or like a 401. What's the one for invalid data? Is it 401? Because 403 is authentication. I think it's 401. Anyways. One or two. What's two? Yeah. I don't know if 402 is truthfully. Okay. Might be just 400. Anyways, we're overthinking it. Uh, the gist of it is that like you can send back, there you go, thank you, a 400 code um, and display that to the user if they don't have JavaScript enabled. And then it, like, they, the, I think the term is like progressively enhance the, the website when you do have JavaScript enabled and show more of a fancy UI. So the... Server side developer and worry wart in me feels compelled to tell all of the attendees here that whether or not you have JavaScript clients and validation turned on on a form, you 100% of the time absolutely positively also need to validate your data on the server side when you do mm -hmm. things. Yes. JavaScript will not prevent hackers from busting into your site through a form, no matter how fancy and schmancy you get with your JavaScript forms. Yep. I'm done ranting now. No, you're good. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, any other questions for Corbin? Thoughts, yeah. comments, React form stuff we want to chat about while we're here? Is House form very secure to use? Um, no more or no less than any other JavaScript library. Um, but keep in mind, security doesn't tend to be a front-end concern like it is don't get me wrong there are absolutely cross-eyed scripting and there's there's all like there's a whole world of security issues that can happen on the front end but when talking about form security it tends to be like what no one was saying where you need to do validation on the back end you don't want to allow a uh, site injection but house form can't prevent that no javascript can prevent fully injection you can only prevent that on the server side. Um, so I would say that Houseform and Formic are about the same level of secure, but that's kind of like a misnomer because neither one of them prevents or helps security, really. Different set of concerns. And for um, clarity here, whatever too, like none of the none of these security concerns in Formic or Houseform are React specific. Mm -hmm. Any, it's all just the way the web of the entire planet works. Like you can build a form in Vue, Angular, React, vanilla JavaScript, Svelte, whatever JavaScript framework comes out next month, next year, two years from now, they're all going to have the exact same security holes in them just because that it's not, the problem is not in JavaScript itself. The problem is not in web browsers itself. It's just, this is how the protocols work that build the entire internet. We would have to. Do the nuclear everything. option, delete all of how HTML and HTTP works yeah. for the planet and do something else instead. And, um, since that's not going to happen, just every every form everyone builds has security holes in it. That's why you have to patch them or protect against them on the back end. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, also, if anyone has any questions about how you build a React library um, or questions about uh, open source maintenance, please feel free to ask. What I heard was, Corbin, we're going to have you back next month to talk about how to build a React library and open source maintenance. What? You know, I'm funny. joking. I'm well, joking, you, but you, like, you know, we we always love having you speak here, though. So anytime you want to put another talk together, we're always the answer is uh, always yes. Where is it? <laughs> I've literally already started writing that blog post. Of course you did. <laughs> Someone asked me yesterday, jokingly, um, if I ever slept and... I like to think I get a decent amount of stuff done, but man, every time I talk to you, it's like, all right, Corbin clearly is not sleeping. <laughs> but like, that, I, I think it's that's like the funniest meme to me because my girlfriend constantly tells me that I sleep too much. She's like, Corbin, get out of bed. You're sleeping too much again. And I'm like, but comforter. <laughs> <laughs> Corbin, thank you very much. As always, we greatly appreciate you taking the time to put this together and show us your new library. This looks awesome. Yeah, yeah, thank you.